Hey gang, so I'm still on my little break this month, as you can probably tell. <laughs> I haven't been keeping up with the appearances so much. But I didn't want to leave you guys totally in the lurch, and I also didn't want the algorithm to hate me too much, so I asked a friend of mine, Matt Farrell, from his YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell, to step in and guest host for today. He's going to talk about a topic that I've been kind of dancing around for a while, uh, but he's been covering on his channel, so it seemed like a good uh, opportunity for him to talk about it here as well. But basically, we're going to talk about hydrogen energy and the fact that, um, you know, even though it might not be ready for prime time with, say, consumer vehicles and whatnot, there's still some really great use cases for it that should be considered, and it should be, uh, you know, on the table in various ways. But I'll let Matt take it from here. Matt, thank you for doing this, and... Uh, Take it away. Whoa, man, Joe makes that look way too easy. Now, before I get started, I just want to thank Joe for inviting me to put together an episode for you all. It's an honor and I'm super happy to be here. In the early 2000s, hydrogen started to gain some buzz as the fuel of the future when we saw cars like the Honda FCX V5, the Ford Focus FCV, and Nissan's X-Trail FCV start to hit the streets. Now granted, in very small numbers, but there was a buzz growing. Around the same time, a little company sprang up with a different gasoline alternative that kind of caught on a little bit. You've probably heard of them, Tesla. And since then, battery electric cars have skyrocketed in popularity and outstripped what many thought was gonna be the hydrogen fuel cell future. Between startups like Rivian and Lucid, or established players like VW and GM reinventing themselves, battery electric is looking like the de facto winner in the passenger car race. Elon Musk has called fuel cells fool cells and that they're staggeringly dumb. But hydrogen isn't going away quietly. 2020 has proved to be an interesting year for hydrogen and what lies ahead, and it has very little to do with passenger cars. But to understand where things are going, let's take a look back at where they started. The first working fuel cell goes back to Sir William Grove in 1839. He knew you could use electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen with a process called electrolysis. His theory was that if you reverse the process, you can generate electricity by recombining hydrogen and oxygen, which he proved 50 years later with something he called the gas voltaic battery. Now, while he proved the theory, it wasn't until almost a century later that Francis Thomas Bacon invented the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, which eventually became the cornerstone for commercialized fuel cells. In fact, it's often referred to as the Bacon fuel cell, which makes me very hungry. <laughs> this alkaline fuel cell has been used by NASA to power satellites and capsules since the 1960s. It's during this time frame that they really started to gain some commercialized success, maybe from that whiff of bacon. So how does it actually work? A hydrogen fuel cell is very similar in principle to a battery design. On the anode side, you supply a source of fuel like hydrogen, which uses something like platinum to act as a catalyst, causing the fuel to undergo oxidation, which generates ions. And these ions, which are positively charged, travel to the cathode through the electrolyte in an electrical circuit. This is where the direct current is captured and put to use. The cathode catalyst, which is usually something like nickel and flooded with oxygen, turns those ions into waste. In the case of hydrogen, because we're using oxygen on the cathode, we're talking about creating water as the byproduct. Most fuel cells produce water, heat, and depending on the fuel source, a little bit of nitrogen dioxide. Fuel cells are similar to combustion engines and generators because they require a constant supply of fuel in order to keep operating. Where they differ is that instead of burning a fuel to release that power's captured heat, Fuel cells are using chemical reactions to release and capture ions to generate electricity. That's why they're a little more similar to batteries than to internal combustion engines. And being able to generate electricity with water as a byproduct sounds great, doesn't it? Just switch from gasoline engines to fuel cells and we're good to go. If only it was that easy. There are several hurdles in the way of hydrogen success. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, but it has to be produced because it doesn't typically exist naturally on Earth. Today, 95% of hydrogen is made using steam reforming using fossil fuels, like natural gas, because it contains methane. The basic process is to use a high temperature steam, usually around 1000 degrees Celsius, because it reacts with methane when there's a catalyst present. The reaction creates hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Not exactly a clean process to make it. And then layer on top of that the energy efficiency of using hydrogen in a fuel cell to generate electricity. Let's say in a passenger car. Most fuel cells fall somewhere between 40 and 60% efficient, and if they're designed to capture the heat that they generate as well, they might be able to get up to the 80% range. Internal combustion engines, on the other hand, are somewhere around 25% efficient, which makes it sound like a big win for fuel cells, but compare that to battery electric vehicles and you're talking about something that's 80 to 90% efficient right out of the gate. Generate electricity from a renewable source to charge a battery, and you've got a winning formula for battery electric. 
but we're still not done with the challenges. There's a lack of infrastructure in place to distribute hydrogen for customers to fuel up their cars. In the US today, your only real option is if you live in California. And even then, you're only talking about 45 stations around Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. More are in the works, but it's pretty sparse. Compare that to 8,500 gas stations and 22,000 charging stations in the state. And the final and biggest challenge is the cost of ownership. Most of the cars usually cost around $60,000 for a base model, like the 2021 Hyundai Nexo. Compare that to the Tesla Model 3, the Hyundai Kona, the Chevy Bolt, or the Ford Mustang Mach-E that all start around $40,000 or less. The cost to fill your hydrogen tank in California will run you between $12 and $16 per kilogram. At the most common price of about $14 per kilogram, it's the equivalent of $5.60 per gallon of gasoline, or about a 21 cents per mile. Now keep in mind that the conventional gasoline car comes in around 13 cents and something like the Tesla Model 3 comes in at six cents per mile. So no matter how you look at a hydrogen fuel cell car today, it's a losing proposition. More expensive up front than both gasoline and battery electric, extremely limited refueling stations compared to gasoline stations on every corner, EV charging stations are still getting built out, but there are thousands of them around. And while not as fast, you can technically charge a battery electric vehicle anywhere you can find an outlet. So yes, Elon's full cell does sound pretty accurate, but not when you look beyond passenger vehicles. At this point, battery-powered airplanes, ships, and heavy-duty trucks aren't a sure bet. You can't just scale up battery packs to match power needs because the weight issues that come along with it. Hydrogen, on the other hand, does scale better. You can get the equivalent of 33.6 kilowatt hours of usable energy per kilogram, which is actually higher than diesel gasoline with about 12 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Now, while building out hydrogen infrastructure for passenger vehicles is a massive undertaking, it's easier to build out fueling stations at targeted airports, truck depots, and shipping ports. It also has the advantage of faster refueling than charging large-scale batteries. You're talking about refilling a tank in minutes versus recharging a heavy-duty truck's battery in hours. And there's a lot of real movement in different industries when it comes to hydrogen. For instance, there's ships. Royal Caribbean has been testing fuel cell technology in its ships and not too long ago ordered a third Icon-class ship for delivery in 2025. These ships will be using hydrogen fuel cell power systems from Ballard. Samsung Heavy Industries, which was one of the largest shipbuilders in the world, is partnering with Bloom Energy to develop a new fuel cell powertrain for commercial ships. Their ultimate goal is to replace oil-based power generation, which accounts for the vast majority of ships today. They're hoping to show off a design by 2022. And cities around the world are already buying fuel cell buses. Holland ordered 20 buses from a Belgian company along with a hydrogen fuel station. In Scotland, the city of Aberdeen is buying 15 more fuel cell buses, and Tokyo is planning on deploying 100 fuel cell buses for the 2020 Olympics, wait, sorry, 2021 Olympics, if they still happen. And then there's aircraft. The company Zero Avia in California has already flown a retrofitted Piper Matrix multiple times, which has a range of about 500 miles. Its goal is to offer a system to aircraft manufacturers to offer a buyer's option. And Airbus is counting on hydrogen to propel its zero-emission aircrafts by 2030. Another place fuel cells aren't fuel cells is data centers, which are opting to use fuel cell installations as emergency backup more and more. Apple's using Bloom Energy's fuel cells for backup and pairing it with their self-contained microgrid of solar panels and rechargeable batteries. It's like an insurance policy in case their grid goes down, their batteries are drained, and they aren't able to resupply themselves with enough solar energy. Fuel cells can also provide power to rural areas that are too remote to be tied into a broader grid. It's a method to effectively create microgrids whenever and wherever they're needed. The South African government is partnering with several companies to do just this. These types of solutions are replacing the need for diesel generators. Factories and warehouses have been using hydrogen-powered forklifts for years now. Walmart began testing 18 fuel cell forklifts in their warehouses going back to 2006. By 2014, they had ordered a total of 2,600 to use across seven distribution centers. And they aren't alone. Amazon, Ace Hardware, and others have also gone this route. The big draws are longer run times than a battery-powered forklift, consistent performance with no voltage sag, no loss of performance in refrigerated storage, and they refuel in minutes. And on top of that, the refueling stations take up less floor space than a battery charging station, sometimes as much as 75% less floor space. And in a warehouse, Space is very important. And one of the last examples is trucking. You have companies like Hyundai and Mercedes-Benz developing hydrogen-powered trucks utilizing fuel cells. The big advantage is they can achieve a longer range without sacrificing payload since they have much smaller batteries, and hydrogen tanks can pack in more energy density. 
Not to mention the faster refueling times that I brought up earlier. Hyundai is testing heavy-duty fuel cell trucks in Switzerland right now and plans to start selling them in the US in 2022. But even after all those examples, it brings us back to the elephant in the room. The very smelly, gassy, polluting elephant in the room. Producing hydrogen today is dirty. Steam reforming is not a great way to produce clean fuel, so we need a greener method that can match the cheaper, dirtier methods on making hydrogen. And that's where green hydrogen comes into the picture. The most ideal method of producing green hydrogen is to use renewable powered electrolyzers. And to kind of recap what that is, it's a device that breaks down water into oxygen and hydrogen using electricity. This happens in a cell with a membrane separating a cathode and an anode, and when you apply a current to the cell, you trigger electrolysis, which is water splitting. You get hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other. Industrial renewable powered electrolyzers achieve efficiencies up to 85%, but unfortunately, only 4% of the global hydrogen is produced this way. But that's starting to change. Hydrogen Renewables Australia is developing a 5 gigawatt project to produce green hydrogen for export to Asian countries. The mega electrolyzer will be powered by a combo of solar and wind using desalinated water from the ocean. The UK is planning to use its offshore wind for a 5 gigawatt hydrogen production capacity by 2030. Scotland is launching the world's first continuous green hydrogen powered plant by tides later this year. And not to be left out, New Zealand is going to be using geothermal energy to produce green hydrogen at some point this year. As of right now, costs are still more expensive for green hydrogen. The International Renewable Energy Agency lists the current cost to be around $2.50 per kilogram. Between the falling costs of solar and wind, along with the improved costs of electrolyzers, it's expected that green hydrogen will be cheaper than all forms of hydrogen produced from fossil fuels by 2050. That prediction is decades away, but the Norwegian electrolyzer manufacturer Nell claims it can hit price parity by 2025 because they're cutting the cost of their devices by 75%. This will bring down the levelized cost of hydrogen to about $1.50 per kilogram, which is the same as gray or fossil fuel derived hydrogen. So if they pull this off, they'll be in price parity in just a few years. Hopefully they can do it. Now, having gone through all of that, I'm not suggesting that our hydrogen future is a sure thing. But I do think that hydrogen has a part to play in the fossil fuel future that we're heading towards right now. Elon may be right about fuel cells when it comes to passenger cars, but there's a lot of other potential uses to consider, and that's what I'll be interested in watching over the next few years. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and if you liked it, jump into the comments and sound off. And if you didn't, go ahead and do the same thing. It's not my channel. I don't care. Seriously though, thanks again for having me on, Joe. It's been awesome. Now I just gotta go practice my chair spin.